Good evening. Welcome for, to another episode of the Climate Chronicles. Uh, really glad to have uh, two distinguished guests with me tonight to talk about a, a recent study that was published by the Competitive Enterprise Institute last week. Um, before we get going here, if you like tonight's episode, uh, you can look at all the Climate Chronicles at the Inconvenient Facts website, which is inconvenientfacts.xyz. You can see other commentaries, videos, and interviews uh, ranging from temperature, CO2, polar bears, even to the uh, witch hunts of the late Middle Ages in, in Europe. Um, without further ado, I'm going to invite uh, our, my two guests in to join me, uh, Dr. Patrick Michaels. Uh, welcome to, to Dr. Michaels. Uh, he's a senior fellow at the Center for Energy and Environment at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. He's also a senior fellow with the CO2 Coalition in Arlington, Virginia. Previously, he was a research professor of environmental sciences at University of Virginia and 30 years as Virginia State climatologist. Uh, he was also president of the American Association of State Climatologists. This is no lightweight that's joining us tonight. Uh, he's published numerous articles. Uh, I've got a copy right here of one of his early books, Meltdown, published in 2004. Uh, it was one of my first books on climate change that I got. Uh, his, his other uh, recent books uh, include Luke, Luke Warming and the latest is Scientocracy, the Tangled Web of uh, Public Science and Public Policy. He holds a PhD in ec Ecological Climatology from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Uh, we first met, must have been 15 years ago, I believe I had you up here. I was president of the local geology society. He had you invited you up as a speaker. We enjoyed having you here. Um, and also of note, I, I quoted you. Uh, more than any other scientist in my book, Inconvenient Facts. Uh, I want to bring in now Kevin Dayaratna, who specializes in tax and energy and health policies as a senior statistician and research programmer for the Heritage Foundation. Uh, he's an applied statistician, has researched and published on the use of high-powered statistical models in public policy, uh, even professional sports. He works on modeling and forecasting. Uh, for the Heritage Foundation. Uh, he did his extensive undergraduate work, holds two master's degrees, and a PhD in mathematical statistics from the University of Maryland. Um, so I'm I'm overwhelmed with the talent we have here tonight. And I believe, Kevin, we first met last year when we both testified before the Pennsylvania House Environmental and Science Committee against the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. We did indeed, Greg. And, yeah. uh, so I want to thank you both uh, for coming tonight, and, and, and it's very timely. You both have published uh, a study, uh, the scientific case for vacating the EPA's carbon dioxide endangerment finding, and that's what we're here to talk about tonight. Um, to get started, I think perhaps I want to lay, let's find out, probably go to Patrick. Uh, give us a little background on, the, on this endangerment finding. What is it? Uh, and then we can maybe get into in, into what they use to uh, uh, to uh, support their findings. Well, it all goes back to a case that reached the Supreme Court, Massachusetts v. EPA, in 2007. Uh, Massachusetts was petitioning the EPA to, quote, do something, end quote, about global warming because uh, our, the non-policy was resulting in their contention a taking, meaning the ocean had risen an inch, and so therefore they didn't have as much beach. Uh, the Supreme Court held five to four that uh, the EPA, in fact, could regulate carbon dioxide. It was a question as to whether it could under the original Clean Air Act of 1970, but it could not do it unless it determined that carbon dioxide was a pollutant, which was defined as something that endangers human health and welfare. Hence, EPA would have to make some finding of endangerment in order to be able to regulate. Well, this happened late in the Bush II administration. That EPA punted, said the science is too uncertain, uh, but Obama was deadly serious about it. It was his second action item in his first inaugural address, and 90 days later, uh, the EPA put out a notice 
uh, of potential endangerment finding, uh, and then. All these uh, myriad regulations, some of which were exceedingly expensive, and one of which, the most sweeping one, the Clean Power Plan, was going to be ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court uh, in an almost unprecedented action. They intervened before the case ever worked through the appellate court uh, and stayed the Clean Power Plan because they said this is clearly unconstitutional. And so... Now, we still have the endangerment finding. We have uh, uh, an administration that's not particularly uh, gung-ho on major carbon dioxide regulation. But since the endangerment finding in 2009, there have been developments in science and uh, methodologies for environmental economics that have come along. And I maintain... and. Kevin and I maintain in our publication <clears throat> that now the science and the economics are sufficient for EPA to vacate its finding of endangerment. Well, let, it's not needed. Well, let, let me ask you, we talked about when, when they the EPA looked into this. In your report here, one of the things I found interesting was the heavy reliance on the National Climate Assessment. Could you address the National Climate Assessment that, that, that they used to justify this and whether or not if they used the correct factors and models for the National Climate Assessment that was used to justify the uh, endangerment finding? Well, under the uh, Global Change <clears throat> Research Act of 1990, uh, the federal government is required to produce periodic so-called national assessments of the effects of climate change on the United States. Uh, the first one came out in 2000, actually between the election and the election <laughs> being decided in 2000. And then the second one came out in 2009, the year of the endangerment finding. Uh, how does the endangerment finding determine endangerment? Well, it applies climate models, only climate models. It doesn't use past climate change as any guide. It uses these general circulation models that have pretty system, serious systematic problems we know now. We did not know of the problems in 2009, but I think they are uh, pervasive and damaging enough that they could no longer be used to project future climate. Okay. And, and uh, maybe you could walk us through now what you found uh what you found, uh, Patrick, in terms of uh, what was wrong with those models? Well, um, number one, there the even even back in two thousand and nine, uh, there was only one model that was coming close to mimicking the evolution of the Earth's climate, uh, say for the past thirty years, and that one was the was the one that had the least warming in it. Of itself, I don't think that would have been the basis for an endangerment finding. Um, then a new generation of models came up, uh, many of which were um, remakes, new and improved versions of the ones that based the endangerment finding. Uh, and John Christie at the University of Alabama at Huntsville uh, looked at their behavior and found an appalling error that all but one of them was making. There were 102 different model runs in this new tranche of models. What they did was they predicted way too much warming to be occurring uh, in the tropical troposphere, uh, particularly up above about 15,000 feet. Uh, at, at one level up there, they were predicting seven times as much warming as was occurring. Well, that's a fatal error, because if you get the vertical distribution of temperature wrong in the tropics, you get the flux of moisture from the ocean into the atmosphere wrong, and that moisture in the tropics is extremely important. For example, 90% of all rainfall that feeds eastern agriculture, meaning east of the Rocky Mountains in the United States, originates in the tropics. 
So if you get that wrong, well, your forecasts of impact on agriculture aren't going to be worth anything. And so there was, there was that error. Now, if I could for a minute, I did say there was one model that worked. And indeed, there still is one model that works. But from where it comes from, you'd have to call the special prosecutor because it's the Russian model. <laughs> and the Russian model works because it predicts the least warming of all of them. It predicts, uh, it has what's called a, an equilibrium climate sensitivity of a little bit over two degrees Celsius. That's what you would get for doubling carbon dioxide. It's got about 1.4 to 1.6 degrees of warming in it for the entire 21st century. Uh, I don't think anybody could say that endangered human health and welfare. And uh, we'll let Kevin talk about the economics and the economic costs uh, of climate change or lack thereof. Well, before we go there, that one point, uh, and again, a, a, a climate sensitivity is the double is is how much warming we could expect for a doubling of of CO two concentration. Is that right? That is correct. Yes, and uh, one of the things you mentioned, what I lo- one of the things that stuck out to me is, is we. We document that using the climate models from the first assessment uh, from 2000 provided less qualitative, quantitative guidance than tables of random numbers. Yeah. And to, to, and what what really gets me, and this is something that ag, ag, angers me terribly, the uh, the chief scientist on the report for the endangerment finding knew it and admitted it that random numbers worked better than what they were using to base the endangerment finding on. Is that correct? This, 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 you're talking now about the first, uh, first climate assessment, yes. one in 2000. Yeah. Uh, we, when I did my review of, of, it, of the draft of it, I looked at the models that they chose. They had a choice of, I think, 14 models. They chose two. One of them was the Canadian model, and it predicted more warming in the 21st century than any other model. And the other one was the British British Met, Met Office model, which predicted bigger precipitation changes than any other model. Why would you choose something extreme? Well, uh, so my colleague, Tip Mappenberger, and I decided to perform a little test on the model, to ask if, ask if they could do the simplest, simplest thing which was simply simulate 10-year running means of average temperature across the United States. In other words, 1901 to 1910, 1902 to 1911, etc. Uh, and when we applied the model, the residual error in the data was greater than the error in the raw data. In other words, Applying the models added noise. It did, models are supposed to explain things. They're supposed to explain variance. These models added variance. And I thought, wow. To give you an example of what that's like, it's like if you gave students a multiple choice test with four possible answers and somebody managed to get less than 25%. I mean, that person would be displaying negative knowledge. Uh, and so did the model. So I wrote that to the then director of the National Climate Data Center, Tom Carl, who's a friend, and um, he was the scientific director for both the first and second assessments, a scientific director, there were three, uh, and he wrote back and said, yeah, you're right, uh, but we just didn't make this test on 10-year running means, we did it on 1, 5, 10, uh, 15, and 25. And we found in every case that the raw data uh, explained what was um, that the models explained less variance uh, than zero. In other words, they produced a negative knowledge, and yet they went forward with these reports. Mm. They knew full well that if this isn't you know akin to scientific malpractice, I don't know what is. Yeah. It's like prescribing adrenaline for high blood pressure. <laughs> yeah. uh, and um, they went forward with these. Yeah. That, by the way, yeah. is, uh, is in our report. And uh, it is one of the things that makes leads one to believe that the EPA was heck-bent on 
doing an endangerment finding despite negative knowledge. Well, thank you. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's move ahead over here to, to uh, Kevin. Uh, Kevin looked at the, what's it called? The social costs of the social. Climate. Yeah, the social cost of carbon, Greg. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, in a nutshell, the social cost of carbon is the economic damages associated with carbon dioxide emissions across a particular time horizon. And the previous administration, the Obama administration, had been using it as their justification for regulatory policy. And it essentially became another basis for policy, such as the endangerment finding, because it is intended to quantify economic damages. And they used three main statistical models to look at the question, but two of the three models didn't even look at costs and benefits associated with climate change or carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, they only looked at costs. So it was pretty much completely disingenuous for them to even use those models. We looked at the third model, the fun model, which actually incorporates costs and benefits. Uh, the costs are damages associated with climate change, such as, you know, from, for example, uh, consequences of increased uh, extreme weather and things like that, or as well as uh, higher temperatures. But the, um, the benefits are associated primarily with agriculture and uh, forestry yields. And we looked at the literature regarding fun and we noticed that specifically the agricultural component, the benefit component, is vastly outdated. The literature that that stuff is based on for the fund model that the Obama administration was using is now about 25 years old. So we looked at this and Pat and I were thinking, and we we're like, well, why not update this, this part of the model and see what the real uh, cost benefit analysis is associated with climate change? So we decided to look at that question uh, right here. And um, yeah, if you could show that image, actually, here is one image um, from one of the papers that we looked at regarding updating the agricultural component of the fund model. You got it, Greg? Is it coming up? Okay. This is, uh, no, 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 yeah, that, no, the previous one. Yeah, right there. This is an image from Zoo et al. 2016, a paper in the journal Nature. And this is a map of the, of the world. Uh, the shaded areas are trends in average observed leaf area index uh, between 1982 and 2009. And you can see that the planet is greening and the areas that are benefiting the most from this greening are the tropics, the deserts. So when you see an image like this, the bottom line is, in addition to considering costs associated with carbon dioxide emissions, it is fundamentally important to take into account benefits as well, which is precisely what the fun model starts to do. But again, those benefits are vastly understated. So we reran the fun model uh, is part of our analysis here, as well as another paper with Pat, myself, and uh, Ross McKittrick, a uh, University of Guelph in, the peer, in a peer reviewed journal. We, we an analyzed these results. And we, uh, we found vastly different estimates of the social cost of carbon that the Obama administration had gotten. And if you turn to the next slide, we can actually discuss this. So these are estimates of the social cost of carbon for two separate years, 2020 and 2050. And again, these are the economic supposed damages that occur across the next can I Can I interrupt? Can I interrupt? Yeah. Just to kind of interpret what we're talking here about social cost of carbon, the EPA endangerment finding said there's a huge Increasing CO2 is going to harm and cost us a lot of money. Exactly. Uh, and they, but they didn't look at the benefits thing. They looked at the cost. So go ahead. I'm sorry. I want yeah, to make so clear again, so this is another justification for this, these types of policy, these types of policies associated with agendas associated with the EPA's endangerment finding. And you could see here in this chart, you could see the row Baker column is the climate sensitivity or how sensitive the planet what is to warming that the Obama administration had assumed. And that has a median climate sensitivity around three degrees, which is far higher than what the Russian model uh, finds that Pat was alluding to earlier that actually correctly gets what, what the warming is. And you could see these estimates here, $19 and 33 cents a ton, $27 a ton. But then when you update the ECS component with more re reasonable climate sensitivities, as well as increases in the agricultural component, which again, as we mentioned before, are vastly understated, you get vastly different estimates of the SEC. And in fact, under very reasonable assumptions, these estimates are negative. So the cost is actually negative, meaning the cost is a benefit of, cl of climate change. Uh, and again, the reason is as a result of agriculture, benefits from agriculture. So the bottom line is from this type of analysis, you can see something very, very simple. A little bit of warming, or as Pat has alluded to it in his book, lukewarming is a benefit for society. 
And policymakers need to understand that fact. And they some do, many do, even the advocates of these policies do, but they ignore it. And it's important for us to call them out on it. Well, thank you. Thank you. And just to summarize then, what you're saying is we're, we're not looking at uh, what you're looking at are uh, increases in crop growth, increases in vegetation, um, both from increased CO2 and also the benefits of warming with longer growing seasons. Exactly. Like longer growing seasons. They, they yeah. didn't include in this, in this EPA endangerment finding. Well, this is, uh, this is all very uh, interesting. And, uh, uh, you know, I, there were so many fascinating things in your report. Uh, again, anyone listening in, I advise you, uh, this is from the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Uh, and uh, you, could, you could search for Competitive Enterprise Institute, uh, Carbon Dioxide Endangerment Finding. I'll have a link to this at, at our website. Uh, the, I'll summarize, if I can, you're I read, reading off one of the final things you guys said. If the uh, models can be shown to be fatally flawed, then their prospective climate forecasts are useless, and therefore any forecasts of changed impacts are worse than useless. Uh, what do you think, we're going to wrap up here in just a bit, is there anything you can, is this something you think the Trump administration is going to pick up? Um uh, in the second term, if there is a second term, uh, or is this something we need to retake the house and add to the people in the Senate? Uh, my understanding, my obviously keen ear for rumors in Washington, uh, tells me that if there is a second term, that it's going to be taken up very early in the second term. Yes. Well, that's encouraging to hear. Um, very, very good. Well, well, thank you both. We're going to, we went actually a little bit long, like to keep it to 15 minutes. I want to thank you both for joining us and uh, uh, welcome any, any of the viewers. Thank you for uh, viewing and catch us. Uh, the next episode will be uh, May 7th. We'll be looking at plate climatology. You can tune in then to learn more about that if you've never heard of it. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Thank you for having us, Greg. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. You bet. Thank you. Good night. Good night.